It has a request from some customers or fans. They saw the first video, they said they'd like to see some of the other fluid dynamics and the other explanations and stuff that I had about other systems besides the traditional. So I guess we'll call this Dream Amp Physics 102 Search for the Holy Grail, meaning a lot of these other systems we vetted as we went through our search for the Holy Grail, me and my uncle did, looking for the perfect sluice box. So for years, not years, so it was actually about three years, we searched for the perfect sluice box, meaning we were convinced what we needed was already out there. We just had to buy it or build it, and we built a lot of stuff, and apply it to our fine gold problem in Libby Creek, where we would shovel in, we pan, 30, 40 specs, shovel like crazy, find 30, 40 specs, and then the math just never added up, so we knew that we were blowing the fine gold through the sluice box. So, anyways, so on this search for the Holy Grail, we tried a lot of stuff out. Of course, first thing we did is with our Keen A52 sluice box, painted metal over it, with miner's moss underneath it, we discovered that our miner's moss... or what some people would call random spun filter media, which is like koi filter media. Uh, miner's moss wasn't actually, the, the what we see called miner's moss wasn't developed for miners. It was random spun uh, uh, matting for filter media or dewatering is what mostly what it's used for. And so basically um, this random spun uh, basically filter net that I'm drawing this cross section. What we would find is that with the miner's moss, that even with the expanded metal above it, we would basically just like a filter. Um, how many remember the rainbow back uh, uh, guy come around with the rainbow vacuum cleaner, and it was the it was the vacuum cleaner that was like dome shaped like this, you know, had the tube on it, and we showed our suction nozzle. Anyways, and it spilled down underneath the water, and then it bubbled up, and so it got the water wet. And he would come in, and he'd go, hey guys, you know, this water filter works better because, and then he would cheat, and he would show your filter, and he'd take your little filter and a round thing, and he'd put it over, and put it in between a tube, and then um, uh, he would uh, basically suck a bunch of stuff into it, and your filter would get clogged. With dirt right away because it was just this little cross section but he was representing what was going on in the bigger filter bag so this old filter technology is really old this is your filter technology that's on your cars and stuff like this or it's meant to only run for a certain time and it clogs up and that's what we saw at the miners moss that we were getting clogged up with all our little uh hematite and black sands and then we were you know turning into this slick plate of black material and we had to clean our box a lot and what was happening was that it wasn't actively exchanging so we weren't getting these nice vortices in here what we were doing was on top here we were getting this big buildup of material and really what was going on and a lot of people still do this and understand it does this here's our miner's moss and for sake of of uh bad drawing, here's our expanded metal, we get this fluid bed of black sands. And what we're trying to do off the tips of all these, with this miner's moss underneath and the expanded metal, we're trying to keep this just enough fluid that it's, it acts like a trap for that fine gold. If it settles in here, it gets buried into this black, this black sands. And this guy is constantly saying fluid. But because we know about the secondary boundary layer now, because we're not going to repeat our physics that we talked about last time, in our main flow, and even if there's any larger port of sea flow that's happening inside the expanded metal, all of our flow is going out. So we still have migration. So migration out. So we still have a lot of migration. And so we, we found what was our favorite um 
that we switch to is we put deep big deep V. 316 deep V. We bought this uh, really deep V stuff off the internet. And so we had um, uh, basically is what we went to, we felt worked best for us with the traditional uh, was the deep V, then the expanded metal over the top with our Hungarian ripple. And, and this uh, the fil this clogged less than the filter media did, so we maintained more active exchange in these vortices. And it allowed us not to cake over and allowed us to for fine gold recovery. But we were still losing quite a bit of gold because again, all our vortices, even in the expanded metal, everything is going out. So basically, that was our basic, you know, our our favorite go-to little box that seemed to be pretty good. And we use it actually every once in a while to check behind. Um, uh, tailings and stuff just because it's a different system and people say well you throw the king behind there check if you catch anything and we throw it behind there so it basically has a little you know cell drops down a little vortex cell um and, I, and what we're seeing is we're seeing a, a braid this way gets pulled out you know your braided wire and then you got your braid the other way over the top but anyways, you got this vor you got this vortex mat, and what we've noticed is our problem with the vortex mat is because if you were to like say here's a 12 by 12 tray, for example, and I was to uh, cap the sides and then make the sides as thick as the vortex matting or height. And I was to fill this with water. So here's my glass of water. And I was to fill this with water in, until we're overflowed. Almost overflowed. So this is full of water now, completely filled, it pooled up at the top. And then I was to dump that into a measuring beaker, a graduated cylinder, I'd have so much water. And that is this volume displacement. So basically, it holds that much volume. So the volume that that holds is what it can process, meaning that we're running material over our mat. And I'm not going to try and get really weird on the, the deep V, I mean the, the conveyor belt, and trying to draw it perfectly. We shovel amount of X amount of material. If X is greater than the volume, it will overburden. So it will heap up. So if X, of course, is equal to, then it would just fill it just enough and it would fall on there and then it would allow for it to be full and then the profiles to then do its thing and work off and flow out and process the material and then you'd have active exchange so what we've always seen is the prospector including me and everybody else is always too greedy and always too impatient and they're always putting too much onto it and so this is a constant sandbar and it's constantly being overburdened they're never running too little because it goes so slow and especially at a flatter pitch where you're like from seven to 10 and that's why they you know there's people that put this in a box and they run it at 15 is because it needs to be run at such that higher pitch so that's the problem that we had with the conveyor belt is it was just too slow and also it was a screen size issue so that meant your 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 you had to screen to a certain mesh so you were really relying on your uh if you had expanded metal above this to capture all your nuggets, of course, and that expanded metal was slowing down on the flow and the action of the vortex map below, and it just wasn't a good combination. So, but by itself, you couldn't catch no nuggets because we were like at an eighth inch, you had to be at process size, and we do have a few nuggets in our area. So, actually, people have found some nice nuggets, and you just got to be lucky. And be in an area that just hasn't been worked in a while, but you never know because that's the way prospecting is. You never know when you're going to get the once in a lifetime deal. So, 
conveyor belt. So that's the reason why we kind of shied away, shied away from the conveyor belt. It just wasn't solving our problem. We wanted to produce, or we wanted to, well, everybody wants to be a miner. You know, everybody wants to go out there and be a miner and move a pile of material. And the conveyor belt just really was damping our style as far as being able to move material. It didn't feel like a, a sluice. It felt more like a finishing system. And then so basically, you know, now let's talk about a system I really kind of just skipped over in 101, and that is, you know, our drop ripples. In the drop ripple sluice, especially a lot of our thermoform plastic, what we found is that the instant surge that comes in fills it really quick, and you can see that. And you can see the rocks and the bigger stuff and even darker material slide right over the top before these got active again and then recovered from the surge of material. So, and this is volume displacement again. Here, we'll go do it again. We'll talk about volume displacement. And we had to try and figure out why stuff was doing stuff because, you know, we wanted to know the answers. So here's our volume, X. Here's our volume, X, of course, all the way along that distance, right? You know, this is our, our, our cubic area, you know, volume, X, X. And if we took all this and dumped it into a, a beaker and you measured it, you'd have so much volume. And what we found is if we had to shovel just this in every time, we were slowed down like the conveyor belt. We were slow. And if we thought if we were to sluice with this like we did with the Hungarian ripple, our volume was four to ten times as much. So we were overburdening instantly these drop ripples. These drop ripples don't have any magic physics about them. They just got a vortice that flows and when materials in them or materials in them the vortice is smaller until it works it out. There's no magic going on here. So you have to run it in proportional to its uh, processing capability or its area or its volume that it can handle. And so that's what an active is area of active exchange that it can handle. So we felt that these guys here were kind of an illusion. They were like a snapshot in time. They were only processing a portion of the material every time, even though the recovery might have been good for that, that stuff that fell in there and got caught and we worked it out and held that gold in there. But what about all the stuff that slid over because you exceeded the volume? Now, if you want to go process slow, and you're, you want to process less material, you can run it to where, you know, it would never overburden. But we wanted to shovel stuff in. We wanted to lose, move as much material as we could every time we went out. That was the goal. And then we got another system we talk about. I call these velocity traps. Some people don't. Some people do. We got two people that we know of do this. And then we keep the water up. And it comes out the other side, flow goes like this, we're supposed to collect all our fine gold down here. Now we got one of these in the, uh, uh, a stack system, and it's more to dunk the gold underneath the water, so it stays in the water rather than having it float, but it is kind of a nugget trap. What the problem is with this here, we discovered, because we built this one, actually we built a couple of them with clear glass on the side, we did testing just like on the videos. What we found is we caught uh, uh, grainy gold and big gold, but we didn't catch the flower gold because the flower gold, as we talked about it before, remember, in the last video, is the kites. It's in capture velocity. It's in this flow. It's the kites. It's flowing. And, and the round grainy gold was even better than the bowling balls because the bowling balls were clay, but th if they're metal, they're even better because they're heavier and they had a low surface area so that the flow would skip by and pull out all the other stuff. Now we gave the illustration the other day about the tornado really quick, well, not super quick. Tornado, trailer park, we talked about the bowling ball stain and the, and the truck of bowling balls in the truck. Here's our truckload of bowling balls, a little bit better truck this time. And the bowling balls spill all over, but they stay in the tornado, wipes out the trailer, takes off all the tin skirting on the roof, and it flies away, and so the tin skirting, remember, is our gold. This is our this is our flat gold. This is a tin foil kite. 
in our bowling balls are made of clay and that's all our little pieces of sand. Well, if we got a flat bowling ball that's a certain size in air uh, cross section, so we got to say uh, a one, we'll say uh, one millimeter, we'll just, you know, cross section of our bowling ball. And then we got a little flat, square, or round, flat, you know, so this is a side view, a kite, and it's one millimeter. Same cross sectional density, but it's flat, uh, cross section, but it's basically flat. We know that the bowling balls are going to stay like in a tornado storm, and the tin roof that was bigger is going to leave the building. It's going to be like Elvis. So we know the kites are going to fly out if the bowling balls are here. Now, even if we get rid of all the bowling balls, and the tornado is strong enough to get rid of the bowling balls, then there's a nuclear disaster, and there's nothing left but a crater in the ground, and everything's gone. So as you're taking this material through this uh, uh, velocity trap, which all this really is, is from this point to this point, an orifice, it's going to want to try and equalize this pressure. It's going to want to blow out the clog so that there isn't a buildup, and this doesn't get higher and higher you know, and higher and higher. So it's always going to try and blow, blow that out and try and re reach a equilibrium, equal on each side. So that's what it's trying to do. So <clears throat> if we're coming in here, we're blowing out everything except for big grainy gold, and there's not even pieces of grains of sand, anything that's a kite that's flat gold has long left the building because you can't, you can't change physics. You can't change this physics. Like, the, the world or the universe or we could say God, but whatever is set up is that if the tornado takes the tin away, the bowling balls still stay. But if the tornado is so big it takes the bowling balls, there's nothing left. So all the little black sand is purged out and there's nothing but fine grainy gold in there. All the flat gold has gone. This is just grainy stuff. So that's why we kind of went away from that. We started to notice that all our flat gold that was in Libby Creek was basically blown out. So that system was not capturing our gold unless it was grainy stuff. And we didn't have a lot of grainy gold. We had flat gold. We had like, you know, everybody wants to say their gold's the flattest, the smallest, and the best, you know, it's like competition of who has the, small, the, the flattest gold. But you know, our gold's flat like the, the beach stuff, but it's just less of it. You know, the beach has got way more. But the beach has got way more black sand to deal with. So, you know, and there's always, everybody's dirt's different, but in a lot of ways, everybody's dirt's the same. Okay, so there was that one. So now we're going to talk more about um, another sluice that we did, which will lead to more of the cyclonic or circular or those type of systems. Um, we, I built a couple of these out of ha uh, five gallon buckets in a plastic welder in a plastic bottom where I built a bunch of these guys. I actually built two of them because I didn't want to buy one. So I use half gallon buckets, you know, like here's a five gallon bucket, split it in half, and then I would just put this half here and another half here, and then half here, half here, welded the sides, kept doing this and made my side winder. Anyways, so I made these sluices. So what I found here is in the, in, now if we were to take a cross section in through here and look this direction, right through this point right here, Here's our sidewall. We would see this buildup of material in this eddy. We would see this buildup of material in this eddy. And what we noticed every time with the material is it was stratified. It was uh, candy caned or layered. Then what we would see, and we would run the material, and we'd actually run material with glitter in it. And we'd run a hand scoop full of uh, material with red glitter, and then we'd uh, scoop of material with blue glitter. And we were watching the layers and trying to figure out what's going on because we were doing all sorts of cool tests. We're trying to figure out what's going on really with these boxes. You know, we're trying to do all this cool stuff and trying to figure out what the secrets are and what was going on. And what we've seen happening in the stream, we felt, is the material came in, right away got deposited, and then the eddy would eat away at it. And it would process this material right on the top surface. And it would clean it up to the black sand. So basically what happened is the stuff here stayed on process. And then you had a layer of black sands that got processed. Then you scooped in your next load of material. 
And the same thing. This would process and it would drop out the black and it would pull out all the light stuff but leave the, the, the black sand. So then you had light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, and you had like these layers develop. And so that was saying it was really you're having a hard time processing the material as it was passing by because it was leaving a lot unprocessed. And what was it doing with basically the straight out with no ripples? And we even put down the middle, we had a strip of expanded metal, you know, and um, uh, with V-rib underneath it. We would try and basically, so your sidewinder, you know, would go like this or whatever. Um, and we were trying to catch the stuff that was sliding out the middle. But what we noticed is that it was a, a classified, we couldn't run the big material through it really efficiently because it would hang up, it was classified feed, it took a long time, and the recovery rate just seemed to not be, the proof was in the pudding, how much I mean, sparkles were we pulling out every time we, we took a box out and did a cleanup. And so, and I made two, and that took me a long time to make those guys, you know, because I wouldn't want to buy it, because if we had bought everything on the market, we'd have gone broke, so we had to make stuff. And we were enjoying each other in the shop, me and my uncle making stuff. A lot of people say we'd have really loud discussions. Some people call them arguments, I call them discussions. And we would have, you know, all this fun time together that we would have, enjoying ourselves, having these discussions in the shop. Okay, so then, you know, we... We, were, we looked at this, just the normal uh, tangent kind of flow, uh, the blue bowl kind of sluice thing, you know. We looked at this on a larger scale because some people actually had done that and people are doing it again now. And what we found is the same thing that almost is leading us to where we're going to talk about with get finally get to is the fluid beds. And I'm... Uh, So basically, we have this large column of water. Well, it's kind of going down out there. And the same thing with the tornado. You know, here we got the tornado. Remember, we got the truckload of bowling balls. You know, nice truck. My truck is awesome. Spilling out the bowling balls everywhere. Here's my trailer house. And the tin is coming off the roof coming off this spot right here, you know, and flying away in my thin roofing with the trailer house and the tornado. So we understand the physics here. We understand that the kites are going to leave, even if they're metal, and uh, bowling balls are going to stay. Why did I put a smile on that bowling ball? I don't know. I felt like it. Um, even though they're made of clay. And so in the, in the blue bowl, was basically the same thing. You know, you couldn't put big material in here because the, the bowling balls would stay and the kites would leave. Because the force it would take to blow out the bowling balls, then everything was gone. And, you know, and everybody knows, understands that the blue ball, and they agree that you ran it too, ran it too fast, you ain't catching it. But we classify down to, usually most people start at 30 mesh in a blue bowl. So this didn't really work for like super processing and stuff for catching big goals. In fluid beds, are basically in that same arena where we're basically dealing with the same kind of physics. So regardless of shape, I'm not gonna pick on anybody. We got this, the most popular seems to be out there. We got a couple tubes and we got holes and we built a bunch of clear one of these and I'm pointing the areas, the, the holes are spraying down, sorry. And we built a couple bunch of these and we actually put cameras and we looked up here with the, we looked up here at the clamp camera and put lights in here so we could see what we were, did recording, so we could see what was going on in the fluid bed. So then you got your, your, your basically your funnel that should be tapered because you want to start out big and you want to go small. You don't want to go just a, you don't want to just go a short tube. And well, you can do a short tube and open up, but you want to get a funnel going because you need that kind of uh, funnel thing happening to really to get. There's a thing, uh, uh, fluid dynamics when you make an orifice just like that you create an issue um, with uh, a restriction and you only get so much flow over the side of it. So you really gotta get that taper thing going and it's gotta be really nice and smooth for it to work. So anyways, and then on top of it, you shovel your material in and there's our screen and here's our sides and this is for lack of better screen drawings and our stuff falls into the fluid bed. And this is our big chunky material and the other chunky stuff goes over the top. Anyways, 
So we understand what's going on. So we're, we're pumping water and keeping this active and stirred up in here. And the, and the idea is have a nice fluid bed of trapment to go to grab all this fine gold that would basically fall in here that's swirling around, trap it all. Because it, or else it's gonna jump up out this exit that's at the end. Usually there's a little exit port, sorry, along the back of it, where we're jumping out and we're in our tailings from our fluid bed are coming out there. So basically it's the same deal right here. You can't get away from these physics. If, if, if your fluid bed is gonna fill up with all these bowling balls, the same size as your flat goal, unless you put so much power into it, you know, we're increasing our flow or making our arrows bigger, that we blow out all those bowling balls. But if you blow out the bowling balls, you blow out the kites too. So your your flow, and, what, and a lot of people are saying, well, I find fine gold in my fluid bed, Dave. So what's the deal? The process I'm talking about isn't instantaneous. It isn't like, you know, instantly. Um, the material falls in there and has to process this way out and exchange out, kind of like a concrete mixer would kind of mix up material and pump it out, you know, because it's got the spirals in there. And we put our material in there, it mixes up, but it still comes out, all our rocks come out. So we're basically churning this up. And a lot of times what we're seeing when we do a clean out is what I call a snapshot. Snapshot of what? A snapshot of time. You are seeing a snapshot of certain processing time for when it takes, here's our timeline. Here's our timeline for when that flake goes in. It's going to take an average amount of time, which we don't know what that is. We'd have to do a map and do some introduced material and map it to where that material goes through that fluid bed and works itself out. So what we're seeing is a snapshot of the fine gold moving through the fluid bed, fine gold, moving through the fluid bed at that time for how long it takes for the average to work out is what you're seeing. And you're probably seeing a small percentage, and I would say that percentage is going to be below a certain percent, and I'm not going to give a certain number, but it's going to be way below 50 but it's going to be a certain percentage, you're going to see a certain percentage of concentration that you're going to basically in dead zones, in zones that are inactive in the box. So you're going to see some fine gold capture there. Okay, so that's basically just some basic material handling physics type thing. You know, I've often thought about, you know, and funny is that I bring up the concrete mixer is I really love that design as far as my favorite dry washing design the the golden wheel is what they call it but then there's a wet version too and i've often pondered and sat there and thought and looked over the books and tried to figure out the explanations of what's going on there and the only explanation i can come up with is with the dye so here we got the concrete mixer it's mixing it's got our little fins that are in here mixing it up and as you fill it up, the main hole, let's go from the side, I guess. It's got a lip on both sides. And as you in, in, uh, you shovel into it, and it's got a screen bucket. And it drops the stuff out in here, and we got this fluid bed. And we're spinning. You know, we're spinning this thing around in circles. And as we're filling this up, you know, we're acting as a spinning fluid bed. And it's moving, it's moving, it's spinning fluid bed. It's kind of like a really super slow centrifuge. And then our excesses uh, spill it out over as we fit uh, uh, in. And this at somewhat of an angle too, you know. Sorry, I didn't draw it at an angle. Um, basically, in so it's processing and dropping material out as it fills up. And so if you put some dye... This is the only way I could basically start to think about what was really happening. You put some dye in here, and this was all blonde or clear material or white sand. How long would you take shoveling in your white sand, this is our white sand, into the screen after you put your dye in before you would see it go white again? How long, how many scoops would it take to work the dye out? 
Would the dye settle and stay in there because of the way the uh, material mixes and water and stuff like that? And how long would that happen? And so this is actually a pretty intelligent design. I actually give this an A+. Plus. You know, this is a great design. I love it. It's got a lot of cool mechanics going on. And I think it's actually should be, my opinion, the dry washer of the future in, the, in a, a wet process, a very efficient wet processor out in the desert for research, you know, for bigger gold. But for fine gold, you know, it's one of those things where the gold, to get that big stuff coming out all the time and it's churning, that I would need to really, honestly, everybody, I, I still think there is, um, there is study to be done on this system. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Okay, so anyways, really like that system. Um, uh, and, but the Zetter fluid beds, we tested them and we just, we could not keep our test gold from depleting every run. So that's the way we looked, always looked at it. We'd pan out and we would lose gold every time. So we lost gold in our test beds every time with this, this system here. So, um, and so we're of course searching for the Holy Grail. We're thinking we're gonna find it. And it's just another build. And a lot of stuff we made out of plywood, which is really good because it heats the shop, you can burn it. And the plastic stuff, we've learned you can't burn it. So, and we have we had a, a, a motto in testing, which a lot of people need to adapt. And it's fail hard, fail fast. Meaning, cardboard, duct tape, Dixie cups, whatever it takes for your first initial deal get it there quick uh, uh expense should be not i mean we should just basically just get the, the uh what we want to do is proof of concept proof of concept is all we want and we want to see how it's first and we want to fail hard fail fast because if we invest all this time and this energy in building this nice box on a metal rivets or plastic and all this stuff you get married to the idea you get married to the idea and how good this looks and when you get married and when your idea doesn't work what do you have to do you have to go through a painful divorce and you don't want to have divorces in the in the r d R&D, you don't want to have no divorces. You want to actually just be kind of a, a, a free moral agent. Now, I'll say that loosely. I'm not trying to talk about, you know, going around, going around. But, you know, you want to be able to test everything. <laughs> and you want, to, you want to be a free roaming agent. You know, R&D. And you don't want to be attached to nothing. You want to be very fluid in the directions that you go. And if you start developing a marriage and you get married to an idea and start developing this crazy concept pretty soon you're trying to sell that concept because you got so much time and money into it i think this happens to a lot of people i'm not trying to be a dink here but you got so much time and money in this thing you need a payday and when you're broke and you're starving a lot of people do anything for a payday and that's what happens a lot of times with designs i think instead of going through and getting proof of concept and getting your object to work in the fail hard fail fast when you can make something work like a daisy and fail hard, fail fast, and you can't break it, and the only thing you're breaking is your duct tape and your Dixie cups or whatever it is, you know, and your cardboard and all that stuff, you're doing good. And then when you get proof of concept, then you say, hey, this thing is, we've tried breaking this thing so many times it won't break. Now, let's spend a little money. Not a lot, a little money, and let's do something that's a little bit shinier and see what happens. So anyways... Sorry, I had to throw that in there, but um, uh, I like you know been done so much R and D, and we you learn the hard way. You can't spend money on something. Well, you can gamble. Anybody gambles a lot, all types of different types of gambling um, out there, and gambling with design work is one of them. And okay, so now let's talk about these last couple ones I glossed over before, where we got basically all these little holes. In, in a sluice box and we got this in a couple designs we got this like i said in the cross section where it's uh tapered and it's got a spiral in it and then we got the same one which i call lego mat and they're just little bit they're just little cups 
And this acts like, okay, now, since I got you zoomed in, when the flow is going by, and it, it touches this edge and this edge, there isn't very much uh, exchange going on there. When we hit this edge, we got more. And so we get this vortice. And we're going to blow this up now. And here's our deal. And we get this vortice going. Okay. And even if it's got the inner spiral in it, we may have some tumbling. When it's empty, this vortice back to the edges, if we go on this cross section like this, what we see is that it, as wide as point is there, but then it shrinks down, your circle shrinks down again, and this went past that leading edge. So your vortice is kind of like tumbling in this really effective zone like here. And then it gets smaller towards the edges. So if we did a cross section right here, you know, your vortice would be smaller because it's up against the edge. So anyways, we see basically the same thing that happens with the drop ripple. This is basically a circular peg hole drop ripple. Actually, the drop ripple has more area, impeding area on it for the developing. I'm going to try my stupid 3D here. And it was really bad, really fast. That was a that was called a train wreck. We can make a crash noises. You can all laugh. It's okay. Laugh with me. I'm, I'm, I'm easy. So you got your, your 3D here. And you got your, your, um, uh, your drop ripple in the bottom of it. You got this big edge that these what these guys are hitting, and it's all the way across. And so you get that nice tumbling horizontal wave. When you break that up in each segment of our bunch of holes, you're just lessening that distance of your vortex. And so once this starts filling with material, when the material comes in, just like the drop ripples, your vortex is less. Because then we talked about that in the first video, the wave, fill the shoreline, fill in the, and how the crashing wave and everything, the reality is, is the vortex isn't living down in here. Even though it's spinning somewhat, you're, it's, it's tumbling, you ain't getting a, a great active exchange. And you're starting overburdening. What we're talking about here is not in that magical, uh, uh, sorry, when I talk about, you know, that overburdening and stuff, a lot of people say, no, bull crap, I watched my sluice and we're screening it processes. We're not talking about when you let it go empty and you're just looking at it for a while. Go to the drop ripples again. Now drive this home. Remember we talked about our drop ripples and how big they were? Remember we talked about that? We talked about our cubic displacement on our drop ripples here how big they are and our cubic displacement on each one of these if you were to fill all these up and then dump this material out into a beaker remember we talked about this we're talking about this is our water what we're talking about is when here's your sluice and someone introduces this much of material which is just a shovel load instead of the baby Scooper load, the little green, I call them baby scoops, those little green scoopers. I laugh, you know, I call them the baby scoopers. And I got the grain scoop for the dream mat when I'm processing just a six inch, which is four times the volume of those green scoopers. This is the grain scooper that you see down at the, uh, the ag center is what that is. So that guy is four cups and this guy here is barely over a cup, you know, the green thing. So anyways, and when, so when we introduce four times the material here than this can handle, we fill these up right away. And we got one times of the material going into the cells, three times the materials leaving the box. And then after three times has left the building, sorry, I'm up out of the, out of the, the area here. After three times has left the building, then we start to see this clear up and do this active exchange and do, like I said, a pretty good job of cleaning that stuff out, like I said. But it's not processing all four times of the material. It isn't doing it. And that's what I'm talking about when I was mentioning, I'm going to go back to it. Oh, this eraser time is killing me. Not my arm, I mean, but for making the video long. It's weakening my, you can hear it squeaking. 
my um, uh, wooden hinges. So um, the frame. But when we were talking about all these little peg holes in the Lego mat and then the cone mat, we're, that's what we're talking about looking at this thing from the side. We're talking about the volume displacement, you know, and I know they guys got the drop ripple in between, but even that's a volume thing there too. So what you got going on here is when this is full and then it's too full and material's going out, you got that basically that it overburdens. And that's what I was talking about when I was mentioning that overburdening and it really isn't just processing. Yeah, after everything's clear, it processes. And what the deal is, is because it doesn't have the Dream Mat Inlet. Uh-oh, I'm talking about Dream Mat now. We're supposed to be just talking about air stuff. I don't got the turbo or the pump or the inlet, which it is an inlet. It is a, is a driver. It's a motor. I mean, this thing has got, you know, this is a, this is a Hemi, man. It's a Hemi on this guy, pumping this guy and processing it. And it's always pushing that material and always pumping it because we got that higher wall in the back. The wall that sticks up and it, it drives, well, it's not on there, but it's on the, on, the, on the dream mat. You know, it's got that wall that sticks up and there's cells down here lower. And so when the water hits this high wall and it's higher than the material that's in it, it's always pumping even when this is full of material. So it's got this intelligent design going on here. It's got this 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 wall that allows for that compression of all that material anyways so we just got one more other guy to talk about and then we can kind of land the plane here and say this is these other systems and how they compare and people were asking hey let's talk about those and the other one is another the last cyclonic one or there's actually two classes of them there's the the simple uh, cyclonic filter that you see out there in the engineering world, even though it's not has nothing to do with prospecting, and then we see this basically deal going on. You know, we got our um, uh, depending on which way to flow, is it could go either way. So flow can go either way in these guys. So these cyclonic filters or separators, and and then we got the bulb filter. You know, the cyclonic bulb filter where we've all seen these on our airlines and stuff, where we spin around here and it collects the sediment. And then our clean goes out here. Um, so one of the other ones we're going to look at is the kind of like the mutt, I would call it. The hydrocyclone, sort of, not really, on top of a fluid jig. Where we got fluid pressure being pushed into here and it's jigging. It's lifting up. It's a jig. I know they call it this great thing. But that thing that they're calling it is for particles that are 30 to 100 times smaller what they're used for than what we're using for in mining at just sand. So that is for like really microbial saw, saw uh, small profiles. And we're trying to put that into a big unit. And what I want to get at here, the, hydro, cyclo, the cyclonic but jigging or the cyclonic separation is we always got this issue. Okay, even if we're spinning and collecting here, we still got to get rid of our heavy material. Unless we just sit here and spin crap forever, and it's the same crap. And um, uh, one of the problems is, is that this fluid path, which we're going to talk about right here, which is the jig, it can't collect the kites and hold up the bowling balls. It's impossible. So what we got here is a total impossible if the kites, here's our little area, our kites are bigger and heavier than the bowling balls. Yes. Same size. No. These are equal? No. If this is, if the, if the kite is greater than, yes. If they're equal, no. Or of course, if they're smaller, hell no. 
So basically what we got going on is here, this bowling, this, this, this ball is so efficient and it can just drop through the fluid really easy that it's just going to drop through. But if the flow going up is resisting that ball and keeping that ball up in this area that's spinning around in circles, it's keeping the kites up there too. And the only way it's going to drop anything out is if these guys are small enough where we, this is what we call, and I'm going to actually use a, a, some terminology now that actually will make sense to some people, um, but it's a new word for others. And I'm not going to get crazy and explain it, but if there's a delta. And a lot of people use delta P and pressure, but what they're talking about is in order of magnitude, meaning 10 times, well, usually most people, it's 100 times a delta, or 1,000 times, 10,000 times. It's whatever scale they choose to measure this delta on. And it, 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 it really don't get stuck up on the number of times there, because it's whatever scale they deem necessary, okay, in whatever they're measuring. So what we mean now, going back to our little orifice collection chamber, and we got our kites, and then we got our bowling balls that are smaller, and our kites are bigger, that is our delta. That our delta is that the size in area, we, in this cross section, it looks like just about three times the size, but really in the, how you scientifically measure the volume and everything what's going on there, it's more than 10. It's more than 10 times the size. So basically, it's easy to catch the big flat gold, or here's the other illustration where it works just fine. And by the way, here's the gold ball, here's the clay ball, and they're equal size. Yes, this works. Clay balls stay up there. Gold falls out. Yep, because the the bowling balls are clay and the upflow is enough to keep the clay at bay and keep it spinning in this mess. But when you deal with flat gold that has surface tension is caught in this tornado over here, it's caught in the tornado, it stays in the tornado and it stays up here. And it doesn't need all the bowling balls are falling out and collecting in this area where we're supposed to be collecting and getting ready to collect and all the gold the same size as those bowling balls that are collecting we're looking right here guys is still up here it's not even coming to the collection area so for the gold to come to the collection area it has to be huge compared to the bowling balls this is just simple physics there's no way around this there's no way around these physics that's the way it is. And this is also, now we go to the cyclone, it's the same thing. If we're going to get stuff to come up here, that's why Doc had this little sluice mat with V-ribbon here to catch fine gold that was coming out because he understood that big core stuff would get caught down here in this area, light fluffy stuff would go out the top, and that was his last chance to catch it was that V-rib. And because we had to try and catch both of both systems, and, and, and really this thing here, the reason why they don't make it no more is because the time... And the energy, and, and again, the time, like the blue bowl, how slow it is, and how much it can process, otherwise this throughput was very low. So when something's very low and you can't use it for mining, it's called a toy. So we don't want to sell toys. We want to sell prospecting equipment, mining equipment. So... You basically got to size your equipment for what's going on. That's all I'm going to cover today. I was going to cover the Miller table, but we all understand the flat Miller table where the gold gets trapped on it. And it, it basically is flat gold and round gold. Take BBs, take them into your Miller table room. Any size BB lights, the smallest BBs you can get, and put them on your Miller table, watch them roll off. Ta-da! That's all you need to say about the Miller table. Catch flat gold, doesn't catch wire gold, doesn't, well, not say it doesn't catch it, you keep pushing it up. But chunky gold, brown gold, it just has a trouble with it because that's just the way the fluid works because of the, you're dealing with such low flow and you're trying to get the 
flatten out and you're trying to get those small pieces of gold laid down and let the secondary boundary layer or the fluid flow because it's so small that it actually really isn't hardly developing a secondary boundary layer the fluid to jump over top of it and pin it down with the force of the fluid on top of it but anyways that's how a miller table works so we don't really need to draw that so basically there were some illustrations about our search for the holy grail and stuff that we learned um if you have any doubts about this open up your physics books you can't you can't it's all in there you gotta you know or go on search fluid dynamics go go out there and find out what the real okay Find out what the mining companies that built this bigger stuff and actually sell it for tell you what their process rates are and tell you what mesh you got to screen to and what pressure and what you're what you're you're going to achieve. And then if you come to them and say, well, okay, I, I see what you're selling there, sirs, you know, and you, you email them and you ask them about their process. Well, I want to put this big material. He goes, nope, it's only good for material this size. You can't jump. We don't sell a unit for just raw material. And see, that's the deal. You know, everything that, that, once you get on that fine line of all some of this crazy science, it only works in a certain zone. And you got to have big equipment, mines, mess of them. By the way, you know, like hydrocyclones, I don't know if, I, if you even look at it. You know, you can go Google. Everybody loves Google, you know, or Siri. <laughs> Siri, show me a picture. You know, Siri was up to your computer. Of uh, a mess of hydrocyclones. Um, or cyclones used in the mining industry. And you're going to see basically this huge equipment with all these nests of cyclones. Some of these nests of cyclones have more than 100 clones attached to them in three different zones for recycling and retailing and catching. And, and see, that's the deal is that this equipment, it can run very efficiently in a mine where they they're, have such large equipment that they can process huge amounts of material and screen it and manage it and have engineers and employees and trucks and all that stuff. But when you take that one piece of equipment out of the mining loop and you take it to the creek by yourself but with one thing, it really doesn't work. So what you're trying to do is we're trying to make stuff that works. Anyways, so search for the Holy Grail, that nice goblet. It's going to give us the most gold, you know, got the little diamonds on it, you know, the little ruby. There it is, guys. There's the end. Hopefully, hopefully you guys find your best piece of equipment that works for you. And that's what we've learned in our search with the other materials. Not that it might be everybody else's experiences, but that's where we've at. That's why we basically have, it took us when we stumbled onto basically the, Hydrocycle flow in the mat with the dream mat. We overcame a lot of our issues and we're kind of kind of stuck on it for the moment until something better comes along, which it will, or a new twist of it, which comes along, which it will, because change is inevitable. Change is going to happen and it may happen tomorrow, guys. So get ready, whether it's from my camp or from somebody else's camp. And to see, think that we're going to camp on 1800s technology ain't going to happen. All right, guys, have a good evening. Thanks for listening again.